All right, hello and welcome. Here's the chapter eight video study guide. Um, I'm gonna use this a little bit differently here. I'm going to have a left frame. I cannot draw a circle. <laughs> Let's try that again for good practice because I need to have good handwriting for you. Um, yeah, it's a little better. You're gonna have a left frame that's going to be here the entire time. So instead of going a slide of notes and a slide of examples and such, the left frame will be notes, so to speak. Um, they'll have properties and equations and all that different jazz there. Uh, everything's going to be A number 65, group mixed practice. That was your uh, homework assignment for this weekend, so everything's going to be off that. There's only one word problem on it, so I will do another one for you, or two more for you, rather. Um, 28 and 29. So you can kind of just watch and enjoy. And when this is on YouTube, you can look below, like down there, like you can look right now, I guess, because that's when you're watching on YouTube, and find the info section where there are the timestamps, you know, um, what time each problem is on. And there's the actual channel. If you ever needed to subscribe in case you lose a link or whatever else, go ahead and go straight to that link. It'll go straight to my video section. Now, um, this is once again one of those sets of videos where, look, there are 29 problems and there are logarithms and a lot of different ways to do them and graphing, explanation, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, you have to assume this video is going to be long. It's going to be over an hour long. Um, now, you know, there's no complaint on your end, hopefully. This is supplemental information for one. Um, for two, you know, I teach these problems as I do them. I don't just do the problem because I'm not telling you how to solve a problem. I'm teaching you the scenario for which to do it. And I really think you want to use this video and all my videos and all my teaching methods as a way of saying, maybe that's how you attack the problem. You know, the things that I say out loud are the things that I have to process myself, right? Like, I don't memorize these. I don't know these out of thin air. I acknowledge um, how they work, you know, based on the models, and I make sense of them. And that's what I do as I do these problems. And I'll show different ways of doing them. So once again, please find the problems that you need to solve for. And if you need to know how to do them, then you will watch them. And if you don't, then you'll move on. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started, and I'm actually going to start with the graphing problems first, so this will go out of order in that sense. I'll go the graphing problems first, then all the log problems, evaluate, solve, all that, and then, in the end, I'll do um, the word problems. Okay, here we go. Okay, graphing practice. Here are numbers 8 and 9. I'm going to start with... Um, <clears throat> this one here, y equals negative 2 to the x minus first power plus 1. Now in terms of graphing these, first of all, here's the equation that's being used. It's kind of a standardish equation. Here's a, which is a, a stretch factor of sorts, and when a is um, negative, you'll see your graph go downward. So we see that in this case. Let me actually rewrite this equation as y equals negative 1 times 2 to the x minus 1 power plus 1. This entire chapter, we have never used a B value that was zero, obviously, but a B value that was zero or negative. I don't think we've even used a B value of one. You can't do that with an exponential. So B is either going to be between zero and one or greater than one. So you know that this negative two doesn't apply to it. Even if it did, it would have parentheses. And if it had parentheses and did that, your graph would do some really funky stuff. This is the negative one that's in front. That is your A value. So A is negative one. B is 2, <coughs> H is 1, remember it's X minus H, and K is 1. Now in terms of graphing these, look, if you want to use a table, go ahead, in which case you don't even have to see this problem for it, you can go straight to it. I'm going to show you how to use these values and go straight tableless. Do it completely without a table. First thing is using the asymptote, and the asymptote is at y equals k, and we've talked about that one a lot in class. It has to do with the fact that as x goes forever in one direction, let's say to uh, in positive infinity, okay, your graph will continually go away from the from your vertical from your horizontal asymptote. In this case it's y equals one as k is one. When x becomes increasingly negative, remember x is in the exponent and 2 to a negative power, let's say 2 to the negative 100th power, is 2 over, or sorry, is 1 over 2 to the 100th power, which is 1 over a very large number, which is close to 0. Negative 1 times a number close to 0 is close to 0, and a number close to 0 plus 1 is close to 1 in the negative direction, though. So 
this is a value that it just never crosses. It never does, it, no matter how negative or positive you get for x. And I'm going to uh, stress negative exponents a whole lot whenever we run into those. Okay, so that's the asymptote. And everything that I'm going to do is in relation to the asymptote. In other words, the points that I plot don't matter. It's the distance from the asymptote that matters. The next crucial point that I want to give use to is this negative 1. And I want to find out how to use this negative 1 in some fashion. Because, that, because I have negative 1 times this whole guy right here, wouldn't it be nice if I could make this whole thing equal to 1? Like, what x value makes this whole thing equal to 1? Well, if I made x equal to h, meaning if I picked an x value that was equal to my h value, let's say I picked 1 for x, that would be 1 minus 1, which is 0. What's awesome about that is 2 to the 0 power is 1. And negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. So if I just made x equal to h, if I picked the x value of 1 that was equal to h, you'll see that your value, negative 1 times 1 is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. Here's the value that I land on. Now let me explain where we're at. We're at the value of x equal to h, which is 1. And this distance is super important. This distance is a units away from your asymptote. I am negative 1 units away from my asymptote. And that's a good point to start at. I can always plug in 0 for x if I wanted to, but I'm not then making use of this information. And I'd really love to do that. So this is negative 1 away from there, and that's my starting point. And again, don't take my word for it. Make sure you plug in a table to confirm it and everything else, but that's where I'm going to start. And from there, I'm just going to give use of that b equals 2. Right now I'm one away. As I move over, remember what 2 represents. This is a growth factor, okay? And every time that you increase x by 1, that means you're increasing your exponent by 1, which means you're multiplying your value by another 2, right? You're multiplying it by 2 just one more time. So every time I go over 1 in x, I will double my previous distance from my asymptote. So I'm negative 1 away from my asymptote right now. If I go over 1, I'm going to multiply that distance by 2, so now I'll be negative 2 away from my asymptote. So my new point is right there. If I went over another one, I'm going to double that number again. Right now I'm negative 2 from my asymptote, so this time I will be negative 4 away from my asymptote. And this keeps growing in that sense. I'm negative 4 away, whoops, negative 4 away from my asymptote. When I double it, or when I go over 1, I will double it and I'll be negative 8 away from my asymptote. And so on and so forth. Now, what if we go to the left? What if I go to the left one? Well, if going to the right one is multiplying by 2 each time, then going to the left is dividing by 2 each time. I would be halving my distance. So as I go here to the left, I should be half away, negative 1 half away from my asymptote because I was 1 away before. Now that I'm negative 1 half away, when I have that, I'll be negative 1 fourth away and negative 1 eighth away and 1 sixteenth and 1 over 32, and it just keeps going smaller and smaller. But you'll notice it'll be always 1 over some very large number, which makes it a very small number, but I will never touch or cross my horizontal asymptote of y equals 1. I will always get closer and closer, but never actually touch. So what I do to represent that is full arrow this way, keeps going, and it keeps going this way, but it stops, at so, well, it doesn't stop, but it never crosses y equals 1. So I draw a half arrow to represent that. Keeps going, but never actually crosses that line. They don't ask for this, but make sure that you do understand your domain is all real numbers. I can plug in any value for x, and I will always get a value for y. But my range is y has to be less than 1. I can't get any y values that are 1 or greater than. That's good to know. I almost want to go back to number 9 because I wanted to talk about these kinds of problems more. In fact, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to do that. I'm going to go find another exponential problem first. And then I'll go to graphing logs after that. So those are logs. I'm going to skip E for a second, too, just to make sure that we get some good. Here's one. Let's do the same thing with number 13, and I'm sure you're okay with me moving through on this like that. Number 13, let's find A, B, H, and K. A is 3. B is 1 half. This is like a half-life problem, in a way. H is 0, and K is negative 2. Okay, once again, I'm going to start at my asymptote. y equals negative 2. Horizontal asymptote right there. 
And from there, I can go ahead and make use of my other values. This value 3 will exist as my distance away from my asymptote when I have 0 in the exponent. If I make x equal to h, if h is 0, x is 0, then I will get 3 times 1 half to the 0 power, 3 times 1 minus 2, which is 1, when x equals 0. That distance is 3 away from my horizontal asymptote. That's what I'm trying to find, that use of that number. If I did 50 of these problems, I would stop explaining all that, and I'd do that straight up, and I think you'd kind of recognize that over time. We practiced this with tables and recognized it. Okay, the, the other thing that you might want to do even before starting these problems is you want to say, is my A positive or negative? Is my B greater than 1 or less than 1? Because those things will tell you what the behavior of your exponential graph will be. A is positive, meaning I'm going to be above my asymptote. B is less than 1 means that I will decay, mean my graph should look something like that. It should go downward toward my asymptote as x gets larger, because when you multiply 1 half by itself, a lot of times your number gets smaller, not larger. So um, that's something you might want to do, because that way when you get your answer, when you start graphing it, you want to say, hmm, does that make sense in your head? Okay, each time that I go over 1, I'm going to multiply by another 1 half, meaning I'm going to divide by 2. I'm three away right now. When I go over one, I'll be one and a half away from my asymptote. When I go over another one, divide that by two, I'll be 0.75 away, that's three quarters. When I go again, I'll be three eighths away, and you kind of estimate it, I guess three sixteenths if you want to pick that, and it gets too small. How about going to the left? We divide by one half, which is multiplying by two. So if I'm three away, multiply by two, this time I'll be six away. And if I had good enough room, I'd say I'm 12 away and plot it way up there. So let's go and draw a curve, a graph, and it does that exact same behavior that you expected with it. So there's that graph right there. Not very pretty. Let's just say domain and range again for good measure. Domain is all real numbers, as always, for all exponential functions. And the range will have to do with this limit. Once again, this will not cross y equals negative 2. It won't even touch it. y has to be greater than negative 2 greater than your k value, right there. If I went back to that very first problem, number 8, let's take a look at that one more time. The behavior to expect out of this is you have a negative stretch factor, meaning every value will be multiplied by negative numbers, so reflect it over your asymptote. And then your growth factor, or this, this is a growth, it's what, b is greater than 1, so every time you're doubling your value, so it will grow in the negative direction. You see this as shrinking, in fact, a lot of us do, but we're calling it growing in the negative direction as opposed to decaying from the negative side, which would look like that, where it starts to flatten out at your asymptote. There's a difference between those two. Let's go ahead while we're here. Let's go and do E. I've got to find a calculator, though, because for E, it's very important that you understand that uh, E is actually a value. Now, E is your B value, so what's our A value? It must be 1. Let's go ahead and define these. A is 1, B is E. Let me round it off for you in case E gets confusing for you. It's around 2.7. Let's just say that for now. I will actually use E in my calculator, but just so you're not too lagoo about it, let's call it 2.7. H is negative 2. Remember, it's x minus negative 2. And K is negative 3. Okay, same old, same old. Start from our asymptote here. Let's make sure that we have that there because everything will be placed from there. Now, when x is negative 2, that will give me 0 here, so e to the 0 power is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. When I am at negative 2 for x, I will be at negative 2 for y. It's not really where I'm at for y, but it's how far away I am from my asymptote at y. One last time, I will say I am a units away from my uh, asymptote. I think I said from y. I will be a units away from my asymptote at that value for x, which makes my exponent 0. Now, from there, each time, you have to multiply your val this value, as I go up one, by your growth rate. My growth rate, in this case, is e, which is about 2.7. So this one's a little harder to kind of go about. But if you have a calculator handy, which you will on your test, if you have to graph one of these, we will multiply by e, which is, like I said, about 2.7. So I'll be 2.7 away here. Now i got to whip out the calculator um, to get what e squared is, e times e. Because you take 
and you multiply it by e again. So I'm whipping out mine. E squared is 7.389, so, so about 7.5 if you're getting really, don't get too picky. So I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eh, and a third and a half. It's about right there. Too high to go anywhere else. Now going to the left, this was at 1, so as I'm multiplying by e to go to the right, I have to divide by e to go to the left. 1 divided by e, um, not really a fan of e sometimes, that's about 0.36, so about a third, whatever. About right there, and you can kind of see 4 points is probably the best that I can get for you right there. So I'm going to see what I can do with this graph get it through those points that it curves upward, and we expect it to curve upward. It is a positive stretch factor and a growth because it's greater than one, so we expect it to do just that. Okay, Let's go back to logs, number nine. Um, looking over here on the left, um, logs are actually a little bit easier to me. Logs are a little bit easier to graph than the exponentials, though they do follow the same properties only in an inverse faction, fra uh, fashion. Anything that we were doing with y values before, we'll kind of do with x and vice versa. The cool thing is that we don't have to solve for the value that gives us zero. We don't have to find the value that gives us zero. We know what value gives us zero here. So let's let's uh, work backwards. Um, your asymptotes at x equals h, and the important thing to note about that is, uh, let me come down a little bit here. Domain. There's a domain restriction for logarithms. I cannot take the log of a negative number. I cannot take the log of zero. So the log of your value, let's let's go back up, the log base three of x plus four has to give me some value. So when I look at this guy right here, I cannot take the log of zero or a negative number. So this number has to be positive x plus 4 has to be greater than 0, so x has to be greater than negative 4. So you automatically know in your graph two things. One, where your asymptote is, the value that you cannot be or cross, negative 4. So I'm going to draw a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 4 right here. And we also know that our graph will go to the right. And The only graphs we've practiced have been going to the right as well. It would have to be a negative x inside there for it to be otherwise. So x is negative 4, there's a start. I, sorry, that's your asymptote. Um, <clears throat> from there, let's go ahead and find some points. Now, one important thing here is that if we take the log of 1, okay, if we take the log of 1, the log of 1 is 0. It doesn't matter what your base is. Log of any base of 1 is 0, even natural log. So if only we took the log of 1 in here, this whole thing would be 0. This whole thing would be wiped out. So if we find the x value that gives us the log of 1, then that would mean y would have to equal whatever k is. Like, it has to. That's all it is. So if we plug in the value for x that makes that true, in this case, what would give us 1? Uh, negative 3. And check this out. Negative 3 is right here. It's always one unit away from your asymptote. So we don't even have to say what the x value is. We just have to say when we're one away from our asymptote, log of 1 is 0, so this would go away. What does y equal? y equals 0. Remember your k in this case is just 0. So our starting point is at negative 3 comma 0. Or better yet, when we're 1 away from our asymptote, your y value is 0. There's a good starting point. I'll do this again with the other logs, don't you worry about it. After that, let's look at our b value. That's the next thing that matters. This is that growth factor again, only this time it's the inverse of what the exponential ones were. Before we were moving over in our x direction to say how many times we're going to double our number or have our number or multiply it by e. Now in this case, we're going to be reflecting across y equals x, so we're going to be moving up in the y direction. We say when we go up to that net next exponent, what x value did we need? to get up to that next exponent. So uh, multiplying that by another set of 3. So when we go up by y here, by 1, we're 1 away here. Now we're going to triple that distance away. 1, 2, 3, tripling that distance away from our asymptote. Now we're 3 away. Let's triple that distance away again to 9 away from our asymptote when we go up another y value, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, going downward, same idea here. We're going to divide by 3, doing that same thing. And again, I would, you know, I, I've done it in class. You know, we did tables, and we practiced with inverses compared to the original function and such. So I'm not going to revisit that. Again, if, if you'd like to use a table, go ahead. That's great. I'd, I'd love you to. I'd, I'd love for you to. But what I really want you to also do is make sense of what logarithms do, what exponentials do, and how to make uh, use of the numbers that you have in front of you. I got this problem, and I have another one after that. Perfect. Okay, y equals log base 3 of x plus 1, in parentheses, and then minus 2. So, I don't think I did this last time. Your b value is 3. I'm, I'm going off this. Your h value is negative 1, and your k value is 2. Okay, vertical asymptote is at x equals h. We explained y and established that before, so let's just go ahead and put that there. Asymptote. Remember, when I'm 1 over, that's when I'm taking the log of 1, okay? When I take the log of 1, this goes away. My y value is negative 2. So when x equals 0, or when I'm 1 away, my y value is negative 2. There's a starting point. Boom. Didn't have to explain much more than that. We'll always take a starting point when we're 1 away from our vertical asymptote, just because it's easiest. And 3 is, once again, your um, base. You know, I wish they changed it up a little bit. So when I go up 1, I'll go over 1 or over <laughs> 3, triple my distance away, triple my distance away again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, a little bit off the map, right there, and then this one right here is like going like that, a third away, a ninth away. Um, same graph as the previous one, except there's a shift in two directions. One was, if you take a look, one was a vertical, uh, I'm sorry, um, your, your, as your vertical asymptote shifted three units over, and then this shifted downward looks like two units downward. So a starting point that was before um, at negative three, zero, has now shifted to zero, negative two, so it's down there. But the growth factor, if you want to call it that, everything else is the same in that case. Okay, let's do one more. Now, this is a negative in front, so we'll refer to that after we still talk about this domain. Once again, um, you have to pick the value that, you know, you're saying, well, it can't go on that side of it otherwise. Uh, what's going to happen is, if you think about this before, sorry, this is a plus zero. Here, let's, let's first pick our starting point. When we're over one for x, it looks like we're zero for y, so we start right here. Now, I'm not going over to the left. The negative doesn't reference to the left of. This is still within our x value that we're talking about this. Whatever we're going to take the log of, we're just going to make it negative. So instead of when we go up, we go three times over like that, it's going to be down. But when we go down, we go three times over. Right? It's your y value that is flipping, not your x value. So that's 3 over, and looks like 9 over would be way off the map there. I don't have much room. Let's divide this by 3. I'm not going to do too much to this graph, but you'll see that these that this inverse guy flips your y values over, not your x values. You can try it in the table, but that would be your kind of your final result right there. And I want to deviate away from graphing. I'm sure I've taken up my fair share of time doing that. Okay, let's go ahead and start doing some things with logarithms. And um, here's some logarithm properties that I've had on the board for a little bit, and I've explained all of them, done one at a time. These are two that I'm really going to be talking about a lot because I'm going to say, if you do this property, uh, these cancel each other out. The two important things about these properties, just like any other inverses, think additive inverses, multiplicative inverses, uh, powers and roots, and then these exponentials and logs. Exponentials and logs are inverses of each other. So if I take the inverse of a function, if I take the inverse function of a function of something, then I'm just left with that value. They cancel each other out. Log base b of b to the x power is just x, and b to the log base b of x equals x as well. Uh, so we'll be using that a heck of a lot, and there are some problems where I'm going to say, well, let's try it this way as well, because maybe you want to be exposed to a lot of different methods. So let's go and start with number one. Now, this is a natural log problem, so let me automatically jump to number eight here to get you started on what natural logs really are. They are nothing more than logs with a base of e. 
So natural log is also log base e. If that helps you out, by all means, please write that. And I always use parentheses when I'm saying the log base whatever of to say this is what's inside. I'm not tricking myself and thinking that there's something else inside there. I should have just done this from the beginning right there. Now, in terms of expansion, we're always going to work um, in case of properties four, let's see, four, five, six. In case of properties four through six right here, these are left to right will be expansion. And right to left is condensing, or I wrote collapse on the board, same thing, condensing, going from a lot of logs to a little log or whatever else. So when I expand, what I'm going to look to do here is take care of this 5 to the 1 third power. The cube root of 5 is 5 to the 1 third. And I'm going to apply property number 6. I'm saying if I have an exponent inside my log, that's equivalent to multiplying that exponent outside of the log, because it's saying how many times you are multiplying 5 by in general. Remember, the answer to all of these things are just exponents. Log of something is an exponent. I'm going to rewrite this as 1 third um, times natural log or natural log of 5 over 3. 1 third times is also divided by. Uh, I only wrote log base e to get you familiar with saying that these are the same thing and I'm going to use it when we evaluate some things because you need that. You know, sometimes you really need to just see it as log base e to really make sense of it. Here's your final answer. Number two, log base b of 2x to the fifth divided by y cubed. Okay, uh, expansion. We're going to use properties 4 and 5 and 6, it looks like. We're going to use all three for this. Um, you have to remember that 2x to the fifth is a product. That's 2 times x to the fifth. So in terms of expanding this, first thing I want to look to do probably is, well, use property 4 and say this is a product, so I will separate those two. That's log base b of 2 plus log base b of x to the fifth. Now here's the uh, number 5. That division is over right there. So this will be minus log base b of y cubed. So we've expanded into separate logs, and now what you want to do is look at each of those individual logs and say, can I pull anything else out using property number 6? And the answer is yes. This x to the fifth, I can make 5 times that. And this y cubed, I can make 3 times that right there. So this will equal log base b of 2 plus 5 times log base b of x minus 3 times log base b of y. And those your final answer right there. Moving on. Number three, log. No base represented, but we will talk about that does mean base 10. The fourth root of x times y, all divided by z squared. First thing I'm going to do is take care of that fourth root right there. Remember, the fourth root is not to the fourth power. That is to the one-fourth power. So this is log of, notice the square brackets, because I want to say all of this is being raised to the fourth power. So you can do this two ways. You can either take that fourth power and distribute it into each product and fraction, or you know each, each uh, item here. Or you can automatically take it to the outside. Either way, you're still going to do some extra work because that 4 is being multiplied by every log. So as long as you remember that, you'll be good to go. So this equals 4 times log of x times y all over z squared. Now, as I start to expand this here, remember, this is 4 times all of these guys. 4 times the log of x plus 4 times the log of y, notice I have parentheses all around it to help me out with that, minus 4 times the log of z squared. In terms of expansion, I will actually distribute the 4 through all of them just because, you know, maybe expansion they want no parentheses. That's fine. So I'll go ahead and do that. So the only other thing I need to do is pull out the 2 in front of the log for z squared. So this will equal 4 log x plus 4 log y minus, now this will, this will be 4 log z squared, but I'm going to pull the 2 in front. So that'll be 4 times 2. 8 log z. That's it. Number 4. 
natural log of x squared times the square root of y. And once again, you know, they don't, you know, they don't have parentheses. Eh, I'd put them around just to say to myself, hey, these are all a part of the natural log in here. Very important to have there. So let's go ahead and split these up now. That's natural log of x squared plus, this is property number four, plus natural log of, this is y to the one-half power, all right, square root of y. By the way, when I say these property numbers, these aren't listed in your book in these numbers. I just, these are just numbered this way. When we did these as notes, we went from one to the next to explain how they went. Like, they kind of had to go in that order. Otherwise, I was going out of order. Um, but those numbers don't mean anything. Just when I say property number four, that's the one you look at, and you go, ah, there it is. Uh, this would be one half times the natural log of y. You could also write that as the natural log of y all over 2. And that's my full expansion. There we go. Ah, let's condense. Here we go. Condense means bring them all into one log. Now, as you noticed here, what I did in expansion was I first separated them all into logs, and then I worked with the individual logs to continue expanding. So, like, I did properties 4 and 5 first, ish, except for, like, yeah, ish. I did properties 4 and 5 first, and then I did property 6 to take care of the rest. Now when I condense, I want to go backwards. I want to do property number 6 first, condense anything within individual logs, and then I will make them as one log. I think it's just easier that way, and, you know, you don't know what else to do with that for. Otherwise, you're like, well, what do I do with it? I'll show you a different way to do it if you'd like, um, but I can't get a response from you. So for the sake of time, let's move on. This will be natural log of x to the fourth. That's property 6. And this will be natural log of, be careful here, this is not 3y squared, this is 3y quantity squared. That is a, a you know, you have to square the 3 as well if you're going to do it. Um, so I'll go ahead and square that just for practice to make sure that you know what to do there. Now I'm going to use property number 4 and condense. This is going from right to left. What was a sum of these two logs with the same base, of base E, has now become a product within one log x to the fourth times um, 3 squared is 9, and y squared is y squared. So that's natural log of 9x to the fourth y squared. And you may ask on your test, you know, do we have to uh, square both those guys? Ah, I don't know. For the sake of argument, let's say no. But might you have to do this on a problem, like in general? Yeah, you, you might have to. Chapter 7 material. Okay, number 6. Yeah, let's do a different color. Number 6, natural log of 2x. Can't really do much with that. It's already uh, collapsed. I'm going to go ahead and take care of some stuff in here. Um, this is a difference inside, the, inside there. Let's go and leave the 3 out for a second so I can take care of these guys. Uh, this is property number 5. Here's a difference of 2 logs with the same base. So this will be natural log of x over y, all within one log there. Now that 3 is 3 times this log, so using property 6 again, this is like this 3 being in front, let's put it in as an exponent. So it'll be natural log of 2x, plus the natural log of, careful here, it's not just x cubed, but it's x over y, quantity cubed, like that. So again, for the sake of argument, let's, let's say that we need to cube both the x and the y, just so you can practice it. So this is natural log of 2x, plus natural log of x cubed over y cubed, and you'll see good reason for this, because eventually, you know, I want to multiply these x's together. Now I'm going to use property number 4, and this sum becomes a product inside. So I'm going to do 2x times x cubed, which is 2x to the fourth, oops, over y cubed, all inside. See, there's probably good reason to be expanding that guy right there, as I just did. Remember, you cubed the top and the bottom, just like I squared both the 3 and the y, because that's a product. Here's your final answer. Number 7, log of x squared minus 9 minus log of x minus 3. Okay, um, property number 5, hey, look, there's nothing to do with property number 6 right now, so property number 5, let's go ahead and make this as one log, so this is log, base 10, remember, not that that matters here, of x squared minus 9 all over x minus 3. And you might say you're done, and 
you are with log properties, but there's some factoring you can do. You always want to say, you know, what can I factor? So within the log, you can factor x squared minus 9. That's the difference of two squareds. That becomes x plus 3 times x minus 3. This is all over x minus 3, mind you. x minus 3s can cancel because these are products on top and bottom. That's a factor that exists on both top and bottom. So this is log of x plus 3. Good to go there. And we skipped 8 through uh, 13 because those were graphs. Let's evaluate. And I will show you two different ways to do these because I think I these will go pretty quickly. Let's do this first by talking about what logs are. Logs are exponents. Meaning, this is a number that says what an exponent is. The 2 is your base. Whenever I say this, I'll say log base 2 of 4. This says 2 to what power gives me 4. That's what it says. Your, your answer is a number, that number is an exponent, that's what it reveals. They are the inverse of exponential problems because in exponential problems, as you probably saw a whole lot, your variable was in your exponent. This time, your variable uh, well, I mean, you know, your variable represents your exponent, but this time we are solving for the exponent rather than solving for the value. Um, so here we go, 2 to what power is 4? Well, 2. And 2 to what power is 8? 3. And there's a plus in the middle, 2 plus 3 is 5. That's all you have to do for these problems, just evaluate from there. Now, there will be scenarios, and it kind of exists here-ish, but there will be scenarios where you can't say 2 to what power is 4, 2 to what power is 8. Maybe the numbers aren't that clean cut. You can use other properties. What if I use property number 4 and condense this into 1 log, log base 2 of 4 times 8? That'll be log base 2 of 32. And you say 2 to what power is 32, same idea, 5. You still get the same answer. Um, again, these properties all work in coalition with each other. These properties are the same as, you know, like when we did properties for uh, exponents. You know, I didn't write them out in the left frame because I figured we wouldn't use them too much. But if I had these two things here, x to the a times x to the b, that equals x to the a plus b power. It's saying, how many times are you multiplying x here? How many times are you multiplying x here? Well, let's just add up those numbers. Like x squared times x to the third is x times x times x times x times x. That's x to the 2 plus 3, which is x to the fifth. So same thing here. You have 2 to what power is 4, 2 to what power is 8, and also 2 to what power is 32. You're you're doing the same thing. You're adding these guys, the exponents together, so within represents that product. This is 2 to the fifth power inside here. Okay, now I'm wasting time. Okay, number 15. A couple ways to do this. Like I said, you might separate this as 4 times. Take the log base 2 of 2, which is 1. 2 to what power is 1? Or 2 to what power is 2? It's 1. Plus log base 2 of 16. 2 to the fourth is 16. 4 times 1 is 4, 4 plus 4 is 8. So you can do it that way. Or, you can take that 4, place it in the, this is property number 6, place it in the exponent, and work from there. You can either take 2 to the 4th, call it 16, say log base 2 of 16 is 4, or you're saying 2 to what power is 2 to the 4th? I mean, you're answering your own question. 2 to what power is 2 to the 4th? The, the answer is 4. That's the only number that it can make itself. And 4 plus 4 is 8, once again. Okay, number 16, same idea here. Um, natural log, this is, this is why it's important for me to state that log base e. In case you have trouble seeing what natural log is, it really is log base e. And in this case, you are asking yourself, e to what power is e to the fourth. And again, you're answering your question when you ask that. Right? e to what power is e to the fourth? Well, that has to be 4. Right? e to the fourth is e to the fourth. Um, another way of doing this is, again, using property number 6, taking that 4 and placing it outside here, 4 times natural log of e. Natural log of e, remember, that is a log base e of e. And log base e of e, or log base any, log base b of b is 1. 4 times 1 is 4. This is property number 9. Natural log of e is 1. Okay, log base 2 of 1 eighth. If 
you have a result as a fraction less than 1 like that and your base is greater than 1, you're looking at a negative exponent. We've talked, you know, we, we did some problems in the graphs with that as well. 2 to what power is 1 over 8 is also saying 2 to what power is 8. It's 1 over 2 cubed. Now 1 over 2 cubed is the same as 2 to the negative third power. We've done a lot with that property before. Um, a to the negative x equals 1 over a to the x power. It's that idea right there. So 2 to the negative third gives you 1 over 8. So that number is negative 3. And 4 minus 3 is 1. Now in your test you have a calculator. So with these evaluation things, I mean, hey, go hog wild, use the calculator. But, uh, you know, you still want to make sure you know some of your properties. Like, so on these ones, 17, well, number 17. They give you the approximations of log base 10, by the way. Log base 10 of 3, log base 10 of 9, log base 10 of 2, to the nearest 10,000th. And then they ask you to find these. They're asking you, like, if you didn't have a calculator, how would you do that? Well, this is log base 10 of 27. Let's go ahead, uh, you know, let's find factors of these ga of 27 in terms of these numbers. 27 can also be written as 3 times 9. So I can write this as log of 3 times 9. And log of 3 times 9, using property number 4, is log of 3 plus log of 9. So now, without using calculator once, I was able to, well, when you add these, it might be fun to use a calculator. Um, I can get to these numbers and say what these are. You could have done 3 times 9. Oh, no, you couldn't have. Never mind. Um, so 0 0.4771 plus 0 0.9542. Oh, I have a calculator, huh? Hang on one sec. 0 0.4771 plus 0 uh, About 1 point... Yeah, this is approximate, right? This equals about 1.4313. Let me take the log of that to confirm that. Log of 27... 1.431363. So when you take the actual log, it's about, to these decimal places, 1.4314. So there is a difference. You're like, oh, big difference. Hey, you know what? It is a difference. Okay, log of 81 is log of 9 times 9. Now, before you end up doing log of 9 plus log of 9, which you can, I, I have no problem with that. Think about it this way as well, because these are the same thing. I want you to understand that they are. This is also log of 9 squared. Log of 9 squared is also 2 times log of 9. That is your um, property number 6. So log of 9, so this is 2 times um, 0 0.9542. That number becomes about 1.9084. So once again, I really just want you to recognize the fact that you can do this a lot of different ways. I mean, you really can. You, know, you, have, to, you have to know your way around these logs and around properties and what they all, all represent. But I th you know, there, there's no one way to do these. There's a lot of ways. Sorry I haven't used a different color all page. Let's shift to green for the last one. Log of 3 over 2. Ooh, how kind for them to have actually um, put in parentheses. So that's log of 3 minus log of 2 using property number 5. So that'll be 0 0.4771 minus 0 0.3010. And that equals about 0 0.1761. Now before I move on, I do want to stress something really important. Super important. We can even take a look at the log graphs in a second here. What if we did log of 2 over 3? You can even try this in your calculator, but, but just look at these numbers. You do 0.3 something minus 0.4 something. Your answer would be a negative number. In fact, it would be negative this. right? Log of 2 thirds is negative 0.1761. Try it in your calculator. And, yep. and you're saying, wait a second, I thought you couldn't have negatives with logs. Wrong. We never said you can't have negatives with logs. We said you can't take the log of negative numbers. Taking the log of a fraction less than 1 will, for the most part, unless there's a shift, taking the log of a fraction will give you a negative number. Re think about it. Log of 1 is 0. So log of the fraction numbers that are less than 1, greater than 0, will give you negative values. Let's take a look at one of those logs uh, without a vertical shift.
take a look at this one. Log of 1 was 0. You know, pretend like we didn't horizontally shift. Log of 1 is 0. Log of 3 is 1. Log of 9 is 2. Right? Log of 1 third is negative 1. Log of 1 ninth is negative 2. Log of 1 27th is negative 3. You can get negative numbers from logs. You just can't take the log of a negative number. Right? There's a restriction. It stops you. So I want to make sure that you do understand that difference. Because it's a big one. It really is. That's not a tiny thing. Oh, I've done, done a lot of work. Okay, now solving. Here's where things kind of get a little iffy, and here's where I'm really going to stress 3a and 3b. Because before I haven't <laughs> quite yet talked about that, even though I said I would. Um, well, for this one, I might not really talk about it, but the uh, thing still stands the same. I need to find the same base on both sides, or I need to find a base that I can take the log of to make this work. You say, I don't even know where to begin. Well, one thing that we do know, and I'll go ahead and write this out. This has nothing to do with the logs, really. Remember, all these things that we do, like even, even these things right here, they work both ways. If this, if it works this way, then it also works that way. These are, um, I don't know, interchange, uh, what's, what's the word? They are reversible equations. So same thing with this. If B equals C, then A to the B power equals A to the C power. As long as you have the same base and these exponents equal to each other, that's true. The same version of that is if a to the b power equals a to the c power, then b equals c. That must be true. What other exponent could you raise to other than the same thing if, you're, if your bases are equal? So our goal is to, find the same, is to make our bases the same. If we're able to make our bases the same, then we can set our exponents equal to each other. That's just the nature of the beast. And there's also another reason behind that. We'll go ahead and do that with the logs. Um, I'm going to make 8 2 cubed, right? 8 is 2 cubed. Now you are going to apply a property that was used in Chapter 7, if you remember it. Let me uh, quickly redo that. If I raise power to a power, that is multiplying my powers, right? It's saying how many times you're multiplying 2 cubed. You're multiplying it x minus 1 times. So you're multiplying 2 cubed x minus 1 times. Um, so... Same base. Uh-huh. Four, I, I can immediately go ahead and just write 3x minus 3, I just distributed, equals 2x plus 7, and keep solving. But I want to make sure that I make use of my properties right now, and so you can accept it and say, oh, yeah, you know what, that does work. I'm going to go ahead and use property 3a. As long as I do some uh, something to one side, I can do it to the other. I will log both sides, and I need to log it with a base of 2. This will allow me... Ugh. Now remember, I'm not doing log 2 times, right? I hear some students say, log 2 times this. I'm not doing that. I'm taking the log of this with a base of 2. Log base 2 of 2 to the 3x minus 1 is 3x 3 times x minus 1, or 3x minus 3. And same thing here. They cancel each other out. All that's left is that exponent there. Another way of thinking about it, just, you know, I won't do this again, I promise. Um, another way of thinking about it is taking that 3 to the x minus 1, bringing it in front, multiplying it by this whole guy right here, and log base 2 of 2 is 1. So all that's left is this value. Same thing with 2x plus 7. So uh, now I have 3x minus 3 equals 2x plus 7. Uh, solve for x, x equals 10. There's your answer. Alright, 19. Two different ways to do it. Uh, this is, you know what, we've done this problem in class. <laughs> um, but in case you haven't, or in case you didn't get it. I'm going to make use of property number, where is it? Property 7. If you are trying to learn how to calculate logs with a different base, for instance, let's say you tried to take the log base 2 of 8 in your calculator, and your calculator couldn't change the base. Um, this property takes care of that. Log base b of x is log of x over log of b. As long as your logs have the same base on top and bottom, then, then it doesn't matter. You know, Irrespective of the base, as long as they're the same, this will always hold true, because you will create your base out of that property. So these are natural logs. Now, natural logs have a log with a base of e. As long as they have the same base on top and bottom, this property still applies even this way. 
So in this case, I, I have this scenario, and I want to change it to here because this is kind of, you're like, well, where do I start? This will become log. Let's use a different color. This will become log base x. Remember your bottom guy. This is your bottom guy, log base x of x plus 12. And that equals 2. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use property 3b. These right now are these values here. Um, I will raise these as exponents, creating a base of x. I want these to both be the same. That way, I can cancel out all my log stuff, right? Inverses cancel each other out. x to the log base x of x plus 12, let me bring it over here, is just x plus 12. And x squared, well, that's x squared. I'll let you see that for one second. I'm going to go ahead and go to the eraser and erase this other part because I'm going to show you a different way to get there. There I go. And I and I am realizing that this will be the longest video we've ever had. I You know what? I'm sorry, but I, I am realizing that. Another way of doing this problem is, look, you have trouble because these two logs are here. What if I moved one of the logs to the other side? You're like, that might be good business for me. Natural log of x plus 12. If I multiply both sides by natural log of x, I'll get 2 times natural log of x. And you're like, where do I go from there? Well, I can use property number 6. That would be nice. I can change this from natural log of x to natural log of x squared. <clears throat> Excuse me. Natural log of x squared. And you're in one of those scenarios again where you're saying the natural log of this equals the natural log of that. What other value could I plug into these other than the same thing to make these equal? For instance, the natural log of 2 has to equal the natural log of 2. It couldn't equal the natural log of 3. They have to be the same thing. So you go right from here, you can jump right from here to that as well. But the property that makes use of that is 10b. e to the natural log of x is just x. If I raise both of these and use a power of e as an example to make that happen, then these natural log guys will cancel out. Or another way of saying it is natural log is log base e and log base e. So e to the log base e, property 3a, or property 3b, b to the log base b just gives you that as well. So as long as you understand that natural logs is logs with a base of e, you can write them as that to help you out. But if you want to calculate natural logs, press that ln button. All right, solve the rest of the way. We get x squared minus x minus 12 equals 0. Use your diamond or whatever you need to do. Maybe you've done these enough that you're very good at um, factoring. We get x, what is that? <laughs> x minus 4 times x plus 3 equals 0. So x equals 4 and negative 3. Whew. You say, good, I'm done. And I say, wait a minute. Try and plug these in. I, I, you don't have to plug them into your calculator. Try and substitute this into your equations. You'll get natural log of 16, irrational number, no big, over natural log of 4 equals 2. You can even try it in your calculator. It'll work. Negative 3. Natural log of negative 3 plus 12 is 9. Natural log of 9 over natural log of negative 3. Oh. Try and plug in natural log of negative 3 in your calculator. I'm going to try it on this guy, and I get domain error. You cannot take the natural log, sorry, the log, you cannot take the log of a negative value or zero. You can't do it. It's, it's a domain restriction, right? Nothing, if you think about it, why, you know, why can't we do that, right? I keep saying it. You know, I keep telling you that, and you're like, why? Well, think about what logs are. Let me we go and create a scenario. Log base 2 of 0. Log base 2 of 0 equals x. We're trying to find out what x is, right? 2 to what power gives you 0 is the question, right? Because, again, this property, you know, we talk about that same thing. But 2 to what power gives you 0? Can't, you know, we did some graphing. Let's go back to just one of the graphs with a horizontal asymptote. Let's take a look at, well, let's take a look at one that has a asymptote at zero. And we don't have one. But you can't, you can't get a number that's going to hit your asymptote. 
it'll become smaller and smaller, get closer and closer and closer to zero, but you cannot get a number that becomes that asymptote. Try and plug in any number. I mean, plug in two to the zero, you get one. Plug in two to the tenth, you get, it's a thousand something, a thousand twenty-four. Plug in two to a negative number, a very small value, and you get something very close to zero, but it will never be zero. It'll always get very close. Likewise, if I try and plug in a negative, or a, a value to get a negative number, try negative one, I, you just can't get it. There's nothing I can plug in for x to get this. My domain's all real numbers. I can plug in anything for x, but my range is limited. And I can't get negative numbers out. And I also can't get zero out. So my point about this was you can't, <laughs> you can't raise a positive value, which is our growth factors. You can't raise a positive value to any value and get a negative number or zero. Negative 3 will not work in this case. I cannot take the natural log of 3 or log of any base of 3. Super crucial for you to know. Okay, here's where I start to speed up for you. Because now we've gotten used to the properties. This isn't the, or you can do it this way stuff. Let's start crack a -lacking. Number 20. I'm going to condense this. Property number 6. You can choose to condense these. I will. I don't know the natural log of 4 and anything else. And let's, let's start solving these. 4 times 16 is 64. Property number 4 natural log of 4 times 16. Now that I'm at that step, remember, natural log of 1 equals natural log of the other. You can do this math step or just say x squared has to equal 64. So x equals plus or minus 8. I'll write x equals 8 or negative 8 because I want to check and see if they work. Natural log of 8, good. Natural log of negative 8, bad. Cannot do it. Your only solution is x equals 8. And yes, it is important that you check for extraneous solutions. Now your question might be, again, this is another pause and deviation. Your question might be, why are we getting this extraneous solution? Well, take a look at this. Here we have a quadratic. Did we have a quadratic in our original equation? No, it looked like just an x. So we created a quadratic out of this. Look, if I plugged a negative 8 into this part right here, I'll get a true answer. Natural log of negative 8 squared, negative 8 squared is 64. Uh, so I'll get it here, but in the original equation, this was not squared. So an extraneous solution came about because this, although these represent the same thing, these do have different domain things. I mean, look, I can plug in negative values into here. You can plug in negative values into here, too. It's just you can't take the log of a negative value here. I won't get a negative value out. The only restriction here is I can't plug in 0. Here I can't plug in 0 and negative number. So again, it's just that domain thing. You know, make sure that you identify your domain from the, I don't know why I just erased my answer. You can't, um, you, just, you have to make sure you identify your domain from the onset. And then everything from there will help. You know what? In fact, why don't you do that? Start from this immediately. Say, whatever I get for my answer, I never thought about that. Whatever I get for my answer, my value has to be greater than zero. You say that because you can't take the log of, you know, there's your domain. So you get your answer and then you say, oh yeah. By the way, that. You know, we should have done that with square roots in chapter 7. Okay, 21. Less deviation. Let's, let's keep going. Property number 4, log base 4 of x times quantity x plus 6 equals 2. Okay. To eliminate that log there, let's go ahead and raise these both as, as exponents with a power of, with a base of 4 on both sides. 4 to the log base 4 of x times x plus 6. That is just x times x plus 6, or x squared plus 6x. 4 squared is 16. I need some more room for this, so I'm going to go and shift down here while I can. Uh, x squared plus 6x minus 16 equals 0. Factor, I get x plus 8 times x minus 2 equals 0. And x equals negative 8 comma 2. What was our domain restriction here? x has to be greater than 0 in this case. In this case, x has to be greater than negative 6. So in the end, you have to err to the side of the bigger one. x has to be greater than 0. Either way, negative 8 looks like it wouldn't have worked. x has to equal 2. So x equals 2, there's your answer. Okay, 22. 2 to what power gives you 5? I don't know. 
5 equals 2 to the x. 2 to what power gives you 5? I don't know. So you're sitting here, you're going after that, and you're like, what am I doing? Hey, hang on, I'm going to give a little more room. You start that because you're trying to you know, solve for x, but the thing is, hey, look, x is solved for you. It tells you. It says x equals log base 2 of 5. It tells you what x is. Remember, this number, if I hide everything else, this number is a decimal. Uh, I'm sorry, this number is an exponent. That's what you're trying to solve for. Don't start working here because you're going to go backwards. You're about to do this. I have to log 2 of both sides, log base 2 of both sides, and I'll get x equals log base 2 of 5. You just went completely in a circle. So how do we get the log base 2 of 5 is the real question. And I think they're asking you to do this with a calculator. I guess you could do it by hand and do trial and error until you round to a few decimal places. Log base 2 of 5 is also log of 5 over log of 2. That is property number 7. I can see it right here. So I'll use that in my calculator. And you're saying, what base? And I'm saying, well, in your calculator, it's base 10. But in reality, it doesn't matter as long as you do the same base on top and bottom. Speaking of which, I could have done natural log on top and bottom if I wanted to. It'll still give me the same number. Try it for yourself. You'll get about, to the nearest hundredth, I believe your test asks for, 2.32. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and erase this part and give you number 23. Log base 2 of x minus log base 2 of 3 is 3. Property number 5, let me scroll up and show you it. Property number 5 gives you log base 2 of x over 3 equals 3. Let's go ahead. I got a log base 2, so I'm going to raise these as exponents with a base of 2, and I will get x over 3. Hold up. x over 3 equals 2 cubed is 8. Therefore, x equals 24. That's a good show. Okay, last uh, log problems. Solve 4 to the x equals 12. I'm going to rewrite that. Whoops rewrite that give myself a little bit of room how to solve for x I gotta take I gotta uh, let's go property 3a log base 4 of both sides this allows me to get x all by itself x equals the log base 4 of 12 and again the same thing this is log of 12 over log of 4 but I want you to um look at this in a different light here what else could I do to solve for that 12 is nothing more than ah that one's hard to come up with ah yeah I'm good <laughs> here we go log of 12 like I know it's a fraction answer of, of some sort uh, log of oops I think log of 4 oh no it's not it's an irrational number forget that I said anything before Log of 12 over log of 4 is 1.79, about. Okay, 4 to the log base 2 of 5 equals x. I Once again, I can go about this so many different ways, and if you'd like me to, uh, I will. Um, let's change 4 to 2 squared. If you'd like, I, I mean, you know, you can type this in your calculator. I'm just, I'm just going about it a different way. Two squared is also two to the two, log base two of five. And now, check this out. Now I have um, two. How do I say this? Two to the. Ugh, bleh, 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 I'm saying it wrong. I can reverse these guys here. You know. If I'm doing this, then I could also write this as 2 log base 2 of 5 all times 2. So this is also 2 to the log base 2 of 5 squared. There we go. That's what I'm trying to say. 2 to the log base 2 of 5 is 5. 5 squared equals x. x is 25 without a calculator. If you did this with a calculator, you would do 4. You'd press whatever caret button you have. You'd put in parentheses. You'd have to put in parentheses log of 5 over log of 2, and you would get 25. Let me double check that. <laughs> 4 to the um, log of 5 over log of 2, 25. Ooh, good. 
Number 26, log base 2 of log base 4 of 16 equals x. I'm going to do log base 4 of 16 first. That way I can take log base 2 of that number. 4 to what power gives you 16? Well, that is 2. So, log base 2 oops, of 2 equals x. So x is 1, property number 1. All right, all done with my logs. Let's do some word problems. Well, we we'll, might have to log here. Uh, all right, I have three exponential functions we're going to deal with. A standard one, y equals ab to the x. Sometimes there's a c scalar multiple of some sort, and we normally use it as a division. Uh, we might divide by some things, all depending on the kind of problem. Um, whenever you have that kind of scalar thing, you'll have a number of occurrences with it. Kind of hard to explain now unless we run into a problem with it. We will with half-life. Half-life is just a deriv is just a variation of your exponential functions problem where there's y, there's a, b is one half, x is there, and c is one over t. So you can see that there's that there. And your continuously compounded interest formula is still the same thing. A or y is now a capital A. Your little a is now a capital P. Uh, x is your time, is your function, and c is some constant r. There's a case of multiplying by it. So they're all the same thing. These are all exponential functions where they have this stuff. Now, recognition of what to use for what scenario and when. Um, continuously compounded interest is a case of using e. That is using that growth factor. Continuously compounded interest simply means your interest gains interest. And this value, around 2.7, is a natural value of continuously compounding uh, that interest over time. So if $4,000 is invested in a bank paying 7% interest compounded continuously, how long until it doubles? So here we go. We have our, first of all, we're going to use this equation, a pert, uh, p we know is our initial value, 4000 E is an actual number. I'm going to leave that be. R is your interest. 7% is 0 0.07. Uh, T is what we're trying to figure out. And you might say, well, what's A? Well, what are we trying to solve for? We're trying to solve for when this guy doubles. So what we're really trying to look for is um, 4,000 times 2. 8,000. How long until your $4,000 becomes $8,000? And that's the question. Okay, um, so we have 8,000 equals 4,000 times e to the 0 0.07t. You divide both sides by 4,000, right? Because 4,000 times this guy, this is kind of its own thing. Got to divide both sides by 4,000. You're going to get 2 equals e to the 0 0.07t. What's actually pretty interesting about this problem is we really did not need to know about this 4,000 right here. We just needed to know how long until it doubles. How long until this number gives you... 2, right? It's a 2 to 1 ratio from your initial amount to your final amount. Um, let me move this guy over a little bit. 2 equals, so we have some room to do some work. We need to figure out what t is, and it's way up in that exponent. We do not, I repeat, we do not divide both sides by e or e to the 0.07 or anything like that. t is in the exponent. We need to get it out of the exponent. Natural log both sides, right? Or log base e. I'm just going to go and write log base e on this side to say that I'm doing the same thing on both sides because log base e is natural log. Although, of course, this is kind of a stupid way to write it. I probably should have written it this way so it makes much more sense with the problem. Log base e of e, natural log of 2. Here's an example why to write, why to write one of them on this side because you can see how these cancel each other out. If 0 0.07t. And it's really important to write natural log of 2 on this side because in your calculator, that's what you're actually going to put. So t equals natural log of 2 over 0 0.07 years. And you're like, like, that's not a number. And I agree, that's not a number. Let's go and round that to something a little more appropriate. 0 0.07. It's, it's around 9.9 .9 years. Ooh, there we go. Your question here might be, how did I know it was years? I mean, I know it was a when, you know, I know it was time. How did I know it was 
annual. How do I know it wasn't weekly or monthly? Well, continuously compounded interest is in years. When you do it, it is an annual uh, guy going there. All right, so that's what's happening. Um, yeah, that's that's essentially what's going on. So that is in years. That's the unit. Okay, the last two problems, number 28 and then 29. 28 is a problem that is not on your sheet, so you can follow along. You just kind of pay attention. In 1995, there were 85 wabbits in Central Park. Uh, the population increased by 12% each year. Now, this increase is a huge facet of this, as well as the 12%. Increase says that whatever you had before, you now have more of, which means we are growing rabbits, which means our growth actually is a growth. Our B value is greater than 1. How much greater than 1? If we have 100% of the rabbits that we had the previous year, that means we'd be exactly at 85 each year. That would be a B value of 1. If we have 12% more than we had before, before we had 100%, add 12% to that, that is 112%. We will have 112% of the amount of rabbits that we previously had. Okay. When they say increase by 12%, that means you take 12% of the 85 and you add that to 85. Or another way is of saying that is take 112% of 85. As a decimal, this number is 1.12. That is B. The initial value was 85. We have to solve for Y. We need to figure out what our X value is here. If we use Y equals AB to the X... There's no C value here, and I will explain what C is in a different scenario um, to help you out. I'll do a little more with this problem. We need to find out what Y is. So Y equals um, 85 times 1.12 to the X power. And X is the number of years since you started, right? If 85 is your starting value, then that would mean when X is 0, Y is 85. So 20 years later is what we're looking at. I'm not going to plug in the number 2015. I'm just going to plug in the number 20. 1.12 to the 20th power gives me 9.6 something times 85. Whoops. Uh, 819. It's a lot of rabbits. I remember that one problem. I was cracking up. Over, oh, by the way, this 819.9. So, the new rabbit has not yet been born. There is very close. There are 819 rabbits. There are not 820. We do not round that number up because we have not yet reached the 820th rabbit. We're getting close. Probably in a couple weeks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there's that. All right, now I did say that I wanted to talk about that C a little bit more and kind of like how those problems work. What if for this problem, and I, I kind of have to erase everything for this, and keep the 12%, so think of we know our A and our B. What if instead we said that this increased by 12%, not each year, but every, let's say, four years. Every four years, it increased by 12%. How many rabbits are there today in 2015? So, um, A is 85. B is uh, 1.12. X is 20, as we know. Now we have the C value kicking in, and it's not really, it's not going to be really times x, where we're going we're gonna to be dividing a number. I want us to set up this problem again, exactly how we did before, and you're going to see a difference here. Okay, we have this. Now, what this says, well, what this says is that I will increase my rabbit count by 12% 20 times. I did not say how many years. I said I will be increasing it 20 times. Okay, C times X, this, this exponent thing really means the number of occurrences, and it's a factor of time. So although the first time this was for 20 years, it's not going to be the same this time, because this time it says it increased by 12% every four years. How many times in 20 years, how many times will we be increasing our rabbit population? We'll do it on year four, or in 1999, right? In 1999, four years later. 2003, 2007, 2011, 2015. I counted five times. So this number has to be divided by four. I know it's 20 years later. But there is a factor here that we have to take a quarter of how many times we were doing it before. Before we were doing it 20 times for 20 years because it was each year. Now that it's every four years, we have to take a quarter of that amount. So C is one-fourth if you think about it that way. 
So y is going to equal 85 times 1.12 to the fifth power because this says I'm going to increase my rabbit count by 12% five times. Not five years, five times over the 20 years. So you solve for that number. Not that it asks that question, but we're going to do that here. Times 1.12 to the, whoops, to the, you can't see my calculator. Um, fifth power. I get 149. 149 rabbits. About 150, but 149. So you can see obviously big difference, but that's a huge, huge like plot point <laughs> there. You know, that, that matters. Right? That's what this growth rate thing is all about. It's about how many times you multiply this number unto itself, by itself. And I'm not going to multiply 1.12 by itself 20 times when it's every four years, when I'm going only 20 years. I'm going to do it only five times. Okay, last one, half-life problem. The only thing I'm going to say about half-life is the same thing I was saying before. Half-life is the number of times... Sorry. Half-life is the time that it takes for an element, in this case, because it's radioactive decay of your nuclei. Half-life is the amount of time that it takes for your amount of what you have to divide in half. So in other words, uh, we're talking about iodine-131. That is a, um, what you call it? That's an isotope. Iodine-131. Uh, if I have 8 grams right now, it says the half-life of iodine-131 is 8 days. That means 8 days later, this will be half of what it was before. When this was 8 grams, now, 8 days later, it'll be 4 grams. 16 days later, it will be half of 4 grams, which is 2 grams. Um, 24 days later, it'll be half of 2 grams, which is 1 gram, etc. So, we're going to use this half-life equation to model that. It's the same idea as the other, um, as this equation. Half is now the decay factor, and x over t represents the number of half-lives that it has undergone, you know, that it has endured. Let's give an example. Um, hospitals utilize radioactive substance iodine-131, diagnosis of conditions of the thyroid gland. The half-life of iodine-131 is 8 days. So we know that the half-life is 8. The number of half-lives that it undergoes is this ratio x over t. So for instance, after 8 days, we'll have 8 over 8, which is 1. So 1 half to the first power is 1 half. That's kind of how these problems work. If a hospital acquires 8 grams, that's our initial amount, apparently same as t, how much of the sample will remain after 20 days? So x is 20. So y, which is what we're trying to solve for, that equals a times uh, 1 half to the... 20 over 8, right there. Uh, so y equals 8 times 1 half to the 2.5. 2.5 is your x over t. That's the number of half-lives. It's gone two half-lives and then half of another half-life. So we're going to do 8 times 0.5, which is 1 half, to the 2.5 power. And that is one point, about 1 point 1.14. Or, sorry, 1.414. 1.41. Grams. And that's how much is remaining. So think about that. It should be between, this number should be between 2 and 1. Because after one half life, this would only have 4 grams left. After two half lives, it would have 2 grams left. After three half lives, it would have 1 gram left. So this number is between 2 and 1 appropriately. Make sure your answer makes sense as you do that. How long will it be until only 0 0.01 grams remain? Or gram uh, remains? This is your y value now. y is 0 0.01, and we do not know what t is. So a is still 8. We're still using our same amount. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't know what x is. t is still your half-life. It's still a half-life of 8. x is the one we do not know. So this time, 0 0.01 grams. So our final amount is 8 times the half-life of... What is it? We need to find out what x is. x over 8. Ooh, fun stuff right there. The first mistake you want to make sure you do not do is do 8 times 1 half. Okay? 1 half does the exponent first. We have to divide both sides by 8. Point zero 0.01 divided by 8 is not a fun number. That is point zero zero one two five. But hey, that's all right. 1 half. Let me, um... Ah, 
zero zero one two five equals one half x over eight. What I'm going to do is we need to solve for x. It is inside an exponent. That means logs will help cancel this out. We need to log with a base of one half. We do not do this very often. Very little do we. Er, very unoften do we use a base that is less than one in this case. But this this is important for you to recognize that you do have to. Um, so I need to use logs differently. So right now we have x over eight equals. Now what I would put in my calculator is log of 0 0.00125 over log of 1 half, which is log of 0.5. That was that one property. number. I forget what the number was. So x is going to be 8 times that amount. x is 8 times... I'm going to give you the rounded number, but I'm going to use the real number with it. So I have log of 0 0.00125 divided by log of 0.5. So that number is about 9.64, but I'm going to do 8 times the number I actually have in my calculator, which is 77.15 uh, days. That's the unit. So the question was, when there's point, point 0.1 gram remaining, will happen after a month, two, two and a half months, right? After two and a half months, there will be very little. So this isotope, man, they're going to have to get some more of that stuff, right? There's, there's not that much <laughs> left after that. So uh, there's your answer there. Okay, and that's it. Uh, this did go on for a long time. I do recognize that. So um, best of luck to y'all. And um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Send me an email. Send me a text. Ask on Monday. And check out all these properties, rewatch the video again and again if you need to, and we'll be good from there.